Hey, welcome to this episode of The Soul Trap. We just had something very unusual, very exciting take place, and hey, that's what The Soul Trap Layer is about. Many of you know our friend at Final Fight Bible Radio, Matt Crane, and his books. We've interviewed him before about the second coming, about eschatology, and many other subjects. He has a great book. We want to recommend that you get it called Eden's Fate, about the location of the Garden of Eden, a fascinating study, a fascinating book that we were going to interview him about and we never got to. What you're going to see is he and I doing a sound check. While the production crew was getting everything fine-tuned and tuned in and last-minute changes made, Matt Crane and I started just talking, talking about what was on his heart, what was on my heart. The camera was rolling, and we just started discussing and talking about things. Almost an hour and a half later, we ended the show. I think you're going to enjoy it. We're going to be discussing things that are soul trap. We're going to be discussing things that are doctrinal. We're going to just be discussing things that end time Christians should be talking about. What's unique about this is there's no scripting, there's no plan, and it is 100% off the cuff. It is just two Christians in pursuit of the truth discussing what's on our heart. And we hope that you like it. It's a little bit different than what we normally do, but it's off the record, organic, and we think you'll enjoy it. Watch. So let me let me set the tone for you for a minute, okay? Let me serve you a fastball. Sure. Have you ever read, I believe his name is Miles J. Sanford, The Green Letters? I've heard of it, but I've not read it. Gold. Absolute gold. I read it as a young Christian, and it was a boop, went right over my head. I did not have anybody to, to fully explain it to me. Have you ever read Watchman Nee's The Normal Christian Life? I have read that, yeah. Okay, yeah. I think... The older I get in the Lord, one of the things that fascinates me, and you just brought this up, is when people get saved, we, we tell them they're saved by faith, reckoning on what Jesus Christ did for them, apart from their feelings. They, they, they're apart from their feelings. Then as soon as they get saved, we say, okay, now grab your King James Bible, here's some tracts, and if you want to really be right with God, you better work hard. Yeah. Uh, you better get rid of all your sin immediately overnight. And uh, boy, here we go. And it, and it really becomes a Galatians post-salvation experience almost. Exactly. So I asked you where you were going, where you were thinking. Follow up with that because that's right where you seem to be. So follow up with what you were saying, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. It's just what I've come to realize so... I, I read Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret when I was 16, and I started to understand there's something about Romans 6 and reckoning yourself dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God. I started grasping those concepts as a teenager, but as I grow, grew older and in the fundamental Baptist circles, generally speaking, you know, it's you have to be to church three, you know, every time the doors are open, you got to go to a uh, bus visitation, you got to do this, you got to do that, pass out tracks in order to be right with God, right with God. What are we saying when we say that? We're saying in order to be righteous, righteousness is just rightness. In order to be righteous with God, you need to do all these things when we say that. And the fact of the matter is, there's nothing I can do in and of myself to be right with God. My righteousness with God is solely based on the righteousness of Christ that's been imputed to me. What am I going to add to that? And so I grew up with this idea that there is something about the identity, but also the performance. And I was trying to work those two things together. And then in the last year, I began to realize those two things are mutually exclusive. If it's of grace, it's not of works. If it's works, it's not of grace. You can't have identity and performance based Christianity any more than you can have uh, salvation as a free gift, but you also have to work for it. Those two things mm -hmm. don't go together. It's grace, and then uh, for salvation, it's grace through faith. And after salvation, it doesn't suddenly become works. Like Paul said, you know, you've been uh, having begun in the spirit. Are you now made perfect by the flesh? What are you talking about? Uh -huh. It's grace after salvation. It's the identification now with who you are in Christ. And then the Holy Spirit does those works through you. Whereas what I think has happened is... Christianity at some point 
even back in Paul's day, they in Paul's day they're trying to join the Judaistic Christ, Judaistic Christianity together and uh-huh. add the works of the law to Christianity. And Paul preached against that in every single one of his epistles. Mm-hmm. And in our modern times, instead of Judaistic Christianity, it's this Baptistic tradition, at least in the Baptist circles that I've always grown up in, where you mm-hmm. have to keep these certain traditions in order to be right with God. Um, and it's basically adding works and it's causing a fall from grace. I'm not reliant on the grace of God anymore. I'm reliant on my performance. And then when you create a performance, now you have Christians that are better than other Christians. You know, KJV Christians are better than NIV Christians who are better than, you know, all this other stuff. And it creates an elitism. It creates an Mm -hmm. authoritarian type model. It creates, I believe it's pseudo spirituality. It's fleshly carnal spirituality. And uh, that explains the division, the strife, the contention, the envy, the hatred, the cutting off that goes on in Baptist churches all the time. Watchman, Watchman Nee would call it the, soul, the soulish man. Yeah. Uh, the soulish man. So let me ask you this. I was just looking back again. It's funny how some of the simplest things are so true. <laughs> I was just looking back at Larkins and then the old and then the Schofield model of standing in state, position in Christ versus practice. And then I was looking, I was reading, I said, I told somebody the other day, I think I said it to the church, um, outside of the book of Revelation, and maybe even more so than the book of Revelation, I think the most uh, deep and fence, I would say the word deep, an amazing book in the New Testament, if not the entire Bible, is the book of Ephesians. If you really grasp what is being said in Ephesians. And I would, I would compend them that with, with Colossians. When, when you start thinking about what it means to be a joint heir, what, mm-hmm. it means, what it really means to be seated in heavenly places, to be a son of God, small s, but to be elevated to that level, to be a joint heir, to be in Christ, when you start really slowing down, whether, whether it's Ephesians or Romans, like you said, when you read Romans 6 for years and years and years, I looked for a formula, whether I was saying it or not. What's the formula for yeah. sanctification? And you get to the end of chapter 7 of Romans, and there's no formula. He points you back in all all of chapter 8 to your position in Christ. We are more than conquerors through Him yeah. in Christ. And so I really do think that I think personally one of the things I have failed to do, and I'm trying to work on that, is for fear of people going sideways. Sure. I don't think we've spent enough time on preaching and teaching your identification in Christ. And I actually did it this past Wednesday night. I, I talked about your quantum entanglement with Christ. Uh, <laughs> whereas, you know, they talk about the, the, the quantum entanglement where something that happens here, you could take that electron across space and time, reverse one, and it automatically reverses the other, and they can't explain that. And I said, well, the Bible said that in Romans 6, you were put in yeah. Christ. So that what happened to Christ, you have now become totally identified with. And it's such a deep thing. We, we almost push past that and go, okay, let's get to Romans chapter 12. Let's, let's hurry and get to chapter 12. Yeah. Uh, do this, serve here, go there. But he says, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, those other things, your identity in Christ. And I wonder if the reason we don't have, we don't have Christians acting at a higher level is because they don't really believe that they're at a higher level. They don't realize what they are. They don't realize they're an eagle trapped in a pig pen. They still think they're a pig trying to clean up their life, if that illustration makes sense. Yeah, and that's the episode I, I heard on Soul Trap, the quantum entanglement thing and how you're talking about that. I was like, yes, because I want so badly to change Final Fight Bible Radio to get away from the performance of, in order to be right with God, you have to do. In order to be, you have to do, that's the message. I want it to be, I want to change the entire emphasis of the station of recognize who you are and then the Holy mm-hmm. Spirit will bear fruit through you. That's really all there is to it. Um, let Jesus Christ do the work as opposed to me trying and striving 
to do something for God, you know. Yeah. Um, it takes all the pressure off and you actually find rest in Christ and his yoke is easy and his burden is light as opposed yeah. to the Baptist burden that I've grown up with my whole life. Um, but yeah, as far as the entanglement, I thought it was interesting. One of the things Paul said was he said, uh, you know, he's talking about who he did predestinate. He did for no, who he, who he predestinated. He also called whom he called them. He also justified and whom he justified them. He also glorified past tense. And what's uh-huh. interesting is it's like my identification in Christ because I am one with him spiritually joined with him. I am united in his death, also his burial and his resurrection. And I'm supposed to reckon that to be so by faith. But beyond that, I'm also technically identified with his glorification. And I think that's possibly where he's Paul's getting at with uh, being seated in heavenly places in Christ. Um, In Christ, because I'm one with him, I'm also identified in his glorification, which gives me, uh, the source of my, or, or is an aspect of uh, spiritual warfare and my understanding that I have power in the name of Jesus over the powers of darkness because mm-hmm. of the fact, not just that I'm resurrected, that's a big part of it, and Jesse Penn Lewis and War, War on the Saints really emphasizes that, but yeah. also the fact that I'm identified in his glorification and I have, I'm joint heir with that authority that he has to a certain degree. you you're exactly right. And I think that I was just looking up here, Romans 18, uh, Romans 8, uh, if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now, you, you have to, I've said this before, I think if we understand Paul, like, let me say it like this. If you understand grace, you almost have to answer what he had to answer. In other words, if you if you are preaching grace right, you're almost going to be misunderstood for salvation. Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. I think the same thing could be for our position. I think we're so profoundly connected with Christ that to say some of the things that Paul said to our ears could almost sound, I don't want to say heretical, but scary. For instance, a joint heir with Christ, that phrase right there, you have so what does joint heir mean? That means that I have right to that airship, a yeah. portion of that. But what is he the heir of? That means he's the heir. Of, he, you have to ask yourself that. I'm not going to fill in the blank, but you have sure, to every yeah. knee shall have, every tongue shall confess. So what does it mean to co-rule with Christ? If we, if we believe with him, we shall reign with him. Those are profound. I don't think we're thinking about what that's saying. Yeah. And so then when you go on, it says if we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. Now, if you're looking and you're just slowing down reading that, the next verse says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory. Here's the phrase, which shall be revealed in us. Now, yeah. I'm not saying that we are equal with Christ. That sure. would absolutely be incorrect. But what I'm saying is that Paul's saying that you're so elevated there, that you're Mm -hmm. seated with Christ. Well, what is Jesus seated on? A throne. So when it says that we're seated with Christ, we're ruling and reigning, I don't think that we're really grasping what Paul says, and therefore we wonder why our people are still acting low. It's because they're under this yoke of, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, and I'm I'm just trying to make it through. You're, You're not. You're so unique that the Bible has to call you a new creature. There's not even a definition yeah. for you. You are a new creature. Absolutely. And so, yeah, I mean, I think the older time, I think the Keswick, however you want to get it, the Keswick, Keswick writers, some of those old timers, they they really hit on something, just like obviously the Reformation did. Uh, obviously, the Bible believers have. I think those guys really hit on something, and it's fascinating yeah. what you're saying. I think it's so true. Yep. Hundred percent. I mean, I am sold a hundred percent on this thing. I haven't found. I read the whole thing on the Keswick theology and, you know, why it's wrong and why it's heresy. I, I couldn't find anything that I really disagree with, other than maybe an emphasis on an experience. But for some people, they have an experience, just like when they get saved. Some people, it's more of an experience than others. And this understanding does seem to be a point at the Christian life where you finally wrap your mind around, oh. I don't need to work for my sanctification. I need to 
rest in the grace of Christ by faith for it. Just like I don't need to work for my salvation, I just need to rest in faith in the grace of the Lord for it. It's the same thing. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. It's the same thing. Heaven, yeah. So let me push back then and ask you this. What would you say to somebody who said, listen, what you're saying is true per your standing. You never have to work for your standing. Just like my son. My son never has to work for his standing. He is my son, irrelevant of his behavior, actions, attitude. He is that by position in me. Mm -hmm. However, his state fluctuates based upon his behavior. And the state of our fellowship can fluctuate based upon his behavior and his response to me. Therefore, I can't just tell the Christian, hey, don't worry about anything. You're going to be okay because it, your, your relationship is going to fluctuate, and whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. So, so dive into that a little bit, because that seems to be the immediate pushback where you're giving Christians a license, and no, they can't do whatever they want. If we love him, we'll keep his commandments. How, how, do, we, how do we deal with that within this theology? Yeah, exactly. Well, two things. First is, it's a similar... I don't know if straw man argument is the right term, but it's a similar argument for Catholics, let's say, in regards to salvation by grace. Well, if you tell people that they can be saved without working and without trying to live right, then they're just going to go out and do whatever they want and just ask Jesus to save them. It's like, well, they asked Jesus to save them, but then there's a change that happens. And that, you know, there's so it maybe they get saved and go out and do whatever they want. But it's kind of the same thing with sanctification in the sense that if you tell someone, well, the key is resting in Christ and your identification and who he is. Well, if you just tell them they don't, that that's all that's necessary and they don't have to do this and do that and do this, they're going to go out and live like the devil. What, are they? Maybe. But chances are if the Holy Spirit is working in them, that's not going to be the end result. And then the second thing is the standing in state. Yeah, that's how I've always been taught it. These things in regards to your identification pertain to your state or your standing. I get those two things confused sometimes. Uh -huh. Your position but as far as your practice, well, you need to work and do this and do that. Um, but I would say that it's not a so. So the Reformed theology mindset is that you start at the bottom. And as you go throughout your Christian life, you naturally grow and progress as God does different things in your life. And you get better and better and better and better. Whereas in the New Testament, it looks to me more along the lines of you're either walking in the flesh or you're walking in the spirit at any, any given time in your life. There is no kind of gray, dim light bulb area. It's either the light is on or the light is off. You're walking in the flesh or you're walking in the spirit. And that can fluctuate a lot of different times during the day. Um, but when you're walking in the flesh, you're fulfilling the lust of the flesh. But there's also an aspect where you can be walking in the flesh trying to perform the works of the spirit trying to manufacture the fruit of the Holy spirit through the power of the flesh, which is what the Galatians were trying to do. So with the Christian, I would advise, I would, the way I would put it is, listen, the way you walk in the spirit is by identifying who you are in Christ. When you do that, you do while you're walking in the spirit, you do always those things that please the father, just like Jesus Christ. When he was walking in his father's spirit, did always those things that please the father. The only difference with him is he didn't ever revert to any kind of old nature. Whereas with us, it's a continually daily reckoning yourself dead unto sin, uh, taking up your cross in that respect, daily yielding to the Lord, moment by moment yielding to the Lord. And every time a temptation comes your way, you're forced, you have the option to either, well, I'm going to yield to my flesh. Or I'm going to yield to the spirit. And so it's not a matter of getting better over time. It's just the more you, yield to the Holy Spirit and the more experience you have with the with yielding to the Spirit, the more that's going to be consistent throughout your life and it's going to manifest, it's going to appear as growth in you and you're going to get more experience and as a person it's going to become more embedded into your character uh -huh. of uh -huh. who you are. And uh, I think that's what Peter was talking about later. It's in interesting because you mentioned Galatians again when you get to Galatians chapter 5 there's no formula. I, I, many times I've read through there and it goes, you know, let us walk, walk in this. If we live in the spirit, let's also walk in the spirit, you know, walk in the, what do I do? That's our immediate. Okay. What do I do? What do I do? But the entire premise of the book 
is a positional situation in Christ. Um, and it's almost, you're exactly right, again, not to overuse Watchman Nee, but he would say that the soulish man is, you know, you can go out and drink and get drunk in the flesh. You can also mm -hmm. preach in the flesh. Yeah. And yeah. anybody who's ever preached knows that's true, <laughs> especially yeah. in a Baptist church, you, you yeah. know? Um, and so it is one of those things where I agree. I think that there is this, I think that there, well, I'm not sure how to do that, say that, but that reformed concept, it runs very deep. And I do think that there is a situation where, so this is my, this is what I've been developing lately in my own mind. I, I've been praying a lot lately. I'm, I'm concerned that my dispensation, I'm concerned that my dispensationalism is limiting God. Mm. And here's what I mean by that. I believe that that rightly dividing the word of truth is 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 right. I mean, I am a cessationist. I I, I believe in the. But I, I find when I'm reading the Bible sometimes that my that it's a historical thing, it's a doctrinal thing, and I'm not dealing with a living person, the reality of God. You're, you're just organizing these thoughts and you're defending these positions and 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 that kind of thing like that. And I, I think one of the things that happens is is that. Again, I don't want to get too experiential, but but there is something to the Lord working in your life at each and every point. And, and there is a relational thing. Um, mm -hmm. It is relational. And so obviously my my relationship with my son is going to fluctuate based upon his behavior. So but but I think we have to be careful about overdrawing that line between state and standing or practice. Yeah. And, and because Paul, to me, what I see is I see that like in Ephesians, Romans heavy position, but then your practice is, <laughs> there's balloons going off on the screen. <laughs> I'm using my hand motions. <laughs> but, but, but practice, he never, it, this is what I'm trying to say. I went along when to say it this way, and I'm thinking this while I'm conversating with sure. you. He never said, this is your position. Got it, button it up, file it away. Now, here's how, you, here's the practice you need to do. He never, it, it wasn't like that. He, it's always your practice should be a natural outflow. Yeah. Spontaneous development of you growing deeper, not in knowing what to do, but deeper in knowing who you are in Christ. Yes. Yeah. It is a, the rose petal is a natural outcropping of, of the root. We bear fruit because we are abiding in Christ. So I need to wake up every day, not, not, deep belief, okay, how am I going to do love and do gentleness and do long suffering and do, no, 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 no. That is all a spontaneous development, lesser or more, to the degree I'm yielded to the Holy Spirit of God and I'm focused on Christ and my identity in, in Him. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's going to fluctuate, but it's never a either or, you know, or file this position away, now practice I'm yes. drawing that line too tight. There's a deeper connection. Does that make sense what I'm wrestling with there? It totally does. And I know what you mean. I've wondered about that too. It does like, for example, you know, in second Peter one, he says, you're going to add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge. And it's like, there's this progression, obviously, because you're adding these things. Whereas Galatians, it's like when you walk in the spirit, boom, the fruit of the spirit are just going to manifest and share and love is one of those. And, Peter says charity is at the end of this growth process. And so it's like, how do you reconcile those two ideas without, like you said, driving this hyper dispensational line of saying, well, that's tribulation and this is church. Right, right. right. It, you know, it's just, well, it, to me, it looks like it's a thing where the Holy Spirit, even let's say I'm a brand new Christian. I don't know anything about Christianity, but let's say I grab onto this identity thing and I'm just, okay, I'm wrecking myself dead into sin and alive into God. That's who I am in Christ. The Holy Spirit works through me. But the Bible does talk about growing in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ in this deeper knowledge of who he is. And I'm going to be like a little baby at that time versus years down the road after I've been in practice of yielding to the Lord and following the Lord and letting God work in my life and use negative circumstances to grow me. I'm going to look very different as a Christian 30 years from after I got saved. But it's not that my flesh is trained better 
I'm still doing the exact same thing I was doing from day one. I'm yielding to the Holy Spirit, letting the Lord work through me. But it's like those, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit working through me starts to become more embedded in my own human spirit as to who I am. And I become as a person in the eyes of all the people around me. Wow, that guy is a lot more patient than he was 20 years ago. And Uh it's not that I've necessarily done it. Jesus Christ has always been super patient from day one. The Holy Spirit's been patient. But it's just there's this, uh, I guess, a growth, for lack of a better term. And my Holy Spirit is being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ more and more. I'm, but it's again, it, it's, the difference is I'm not trying to achieve it by trying hard and doing more. My, mm-hmm. my, the way I put it is the mantra of the, and I say Baptist, and I'm not just throwing them under the bus. It's just this is who I've grown up with. But the mantra of the Baptist is do more, try harder, and never forget you suck because you don't want to get prideful. So uh-huh. like that's the three-point sermon I've heard growing up all my life. It's yeah. just do more, try harder, and, and always remember that you're a complete worthless piece of garbage that God uh, you know, loves, but does he really? You know, yeah. that type of thing. Uh-huh. I think you're right because that's – so I think that it's a cumulative growth because there are things where I am right now in my life, in my ministry, that I was reading, saw, it, but it, you know, I had a friend of mine one time say that time is the magic elixir. Kevin Murdoch said that to me one time, time mm-hmm. is the magic elixir. That is one of the things that God uses. That's why it's growth, not production. Yeah. He doesn't produce, you grow and growth takes time. It takes sunshine, it takes rain, it takes manure, it takes, you know, a lot of these things. But that's what we're we're looking for, growth. And I I wonder, you know, I think you have to preach here. But I think you have to give people time to get from here to there. And we're so, in a sense, we want that instant, you should be here, come to the altar, make that commitment, wake up tomorrow, there you are. But God, God works in personality. He created your personality. That personality develops over time. And in Christ, see, I don't, that's the one thing I think that's interesting about the reform. We, we're not mechanisms. We're autonomous to a large degree. Personalities created in the image of God, destined to rule and reign. So the work that is going on in us right now is, is a profoundly deep work. It's not just to keep us in line for right now. Yeah. Paul said this light affliction worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So I agree with you. And I think Miles J. Sanford, I think a lot of these, we call them the deeper life. What's fascinating is if you look at, and a lot of the Bible believers, the Ruckman guys, they like the layout of the, the New Testament, you know, the Bible. They'll talk about, well, when you come right out of gospel, when you come right out of Acts, the first thing that hits a Christian, if you were just following, a, you know, a timeline, is the book of Romans. Yeah. It's deep doctrinal positional Christianity. I can make a case for it that even when you get to chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15, 6, you're still dealing with positional Christianity all the way through. Then you come out of that and you look at first and second Corinthians, and obviously that's that positional Christianity in in, in its working out. Yeah. You know, and what it's what it's looking like. Then you get into Galatians, and it's like slow your roll. You know, you remember, this is what we were talking about. Like Galatians is almost like the, the Reader's Digest version of Romans 1 through 8 kind of a thing. Yeah. Right. Th- then you come into Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians. You don't really get into the into the second coming goody good stuff. <laughs> per, per <se. laughs> you, you know, until you get the first Thessalonians and second Thessalonians type of a situation. Now, I'm yeah. not overemphasizing that layout, but I'm saying we almost bypass Romans. We almost bypass with the new Christian. That's too deep. That that identification. We got to get you soul winning, giving your tithing, get through yeah. church. You're going to get boom, 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 boom. And I think that that gets them up off the runway and maybe even into the air. But we don't have a lot of high soaring Christians anymore. Right. And I think that might be because they just don't have the wings to get up that high, and we're not equipping them with that. Yep. Yep. Hundred percent. I mean, and uh, I'm I'm very thankful for the training I got at PBI, but honestly, I w- when I got to PBI and we were in the Romans class, we finally got to Romans chapter six and I was like, all right, you know, I'm going to get to hear 
this stuff that I've been trying to figure out in my mind, this deeper Christianity, the spiritual life, you know, that really deep stuff that Watchman Nee talked about. Dr. Ruckman's going to explain it. We, I don't think we even spent a few, we've spent hardly any time on Romans 6, just right over yeah. it. And I was really disappointed because like I knew I couldn't wrap my mind around it at the time, but I knew there was something very key about Romans chapter six, verse 11 and all that stuff. And like doc, he, he made the comment like, now this is the type of stuff that, you know, Watchman Nee talked about. It goes over my head. It's pretty deep, deep stuff. You know, some of these guys get really deep into it, but uh, you know, this is your state. When you get saved, you're in Christ and moving on. And yeah, there's like yeah. no practical application of Romans chapter six, it's yes, you're identified at Calvary, but I'm supposed to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection every day of every moment of my life, every single day. Like that is the gospel is not something back there, back when I got saved. The gospel is pertinent right now in my in my life, today and tomorrow and the day after. Right. It's really just the gospel. It's the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, but it's a post Calvary application of it in my Christian life. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's interesting because in Romans 4, I think, sets the tone. Because Paul actually talks about Abraham and says, God calleth those things which be not as though they are. are he, in other words, and, and when you take that chapter 4 and you cross-reference that to chapter 8, where it says glorified past tense, God deals with us on the grounds as if we are already glorified sure. in Christ, seated in heavenly places. In other words, God is looking at us through Christ, the lens of Christ, in one way, and we're looking at ourselves in another way. And that's why I hate that term. Of, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I know what you mean when you say that. Yeah. I don't. I'm not trying to be prideful, just like you know we talked about. But you're not. You're not. You're something profoundly. I'm actually going to teach part two of last week about the quantum entanglement. I'm going to teach a little bit more about that Wednesday night. I think that Sunday morning, I'm going to do that again Sunday morning. I'm going to use it as a salvation message. But I think that's one of the things that we, when we leave out regeneration and we don't really fully understand what it means to be a born again, a new creature, then it really does make salvation a psychological checklist yeah. rather than the development of something happening. And I, I would go so far as to say this, I think it ties back into preaching the gospel because you know, well, I'm afraid, I like what you said, I'm afraid if I don't hold the line, then that Christian's going to, that Christian's going to go haywire. Well, then you have to ask yourself, are they really a Christian? Now, I don't want to get into a situation to where there's, if you're not at my level, therefore you're not saved. <laughs> yeah. But there should be a want to. It is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So if, if it's not there, in my opinion, I think the Christian wants to be free from the sins, plural, day by day. They want that. And, and that may take years to achieve in one particular area in their life uh, that the Holy Spirit is working with. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that they're not where they should be. It could just be a struggle. So I think this all ties in, and I really do think that that is an element. And like I said, I, it ties in with where I am. I know I'm going to get you know, emails out the wazoo about dispensationalism. And look, there's not a guy any bigger than I am. I believe that we, you know, I believe that, but I just feel like we're drawing so many lines so tight with God that God is becoming a, a, the Bible is becoming a study tool per se, mm -hmm. a, a doctrinal historical study tool rather than a, a, a gateway or a doorway into a living, vibrant, powerful relationship with a being who has yeah. personality, uh, who deals with each of us on an individual level. And I know a lot of guys that they're King James only, they have their, their right, they're divided, but there's just a spirit about them. And you're like, mm -hmm. oh, oh, yeah. man, that, that's not what I, I want. And I know I by the, con on the contrast, man, I know guys that they're just wrong on the Bible issue. They're just wrong about that. But Somehow or another, they're, and I'm not talking about a pseudo thing, but somehow or another, they, they love the Lord. And you're like, yes, man, does it have to be either or? Yes, exactly. A hundred percent. And that's Final Fight started out very performance based, very elitist. Um, you know, I, I'm ashamed to say, but that's the mindset that was instilled into me for a long time. And so it was like, we're King James. We have a certain type of music and we're better than everybody else. And 
I, I'm trying to get so far away from that because it's it's not the it's not the Holy Spirit. That is that is a carnal spirit. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Ruckman. I'm of Donovan. I'm of the Baptist. I'm of this and that. And I'll take it even one step farther. What I find is really interesting is this idea that if I do something or if I associate with something, that makes me right with God. If I was to tell an unsaved person, in order to be saved, you need to be a part of this church denomination in particular. That's works-based salvation. We would say that's heresy. Or if I said, well, in order to be saved, you need to, and right with righteous with God, you need to have a King James Bible. What I find interesting is the same thing happens after salvation. This message has been taught so long that if you want to be right with God as a Christian, you need a King James Bible. And so a person gets a King James Bible, and what happens? Oh, I'm right with God now by virtue of the Bible that I use. Yes. No longer by virtue of the fact that I'm identified with Christ and his righteousness is imputed to me and nothing I can do gains me merit or favor with God. It's solely the basis of Jesus Christ and what he's given to me. No, now Mm -hmm. my righteousness has shifted from that to the fact that I have a King James Bible. And what's interesting is that is falling from grace because now I'm going back to a works system, my work Mm -hmm. being having a King James Bible. Paul uses the term subverted. I've become subverted because I'm now basing my merit with God on the Bible that I associate with. And what's interesting is the devil himself could be the one that could get a Christian all completely backwards and upside down with a King James Bible, Uh you know, because now I've gone from grace to works and the King James Bible is the right Bible, but Satan has used it to detach me from my life. Yeah. To use an extreme, Jim Jones preached out of a King James Bible. Yeah, sure. So we, we, we have to be careful. And of course, man, listen, if this comes, when we release this, you know, they're going to just eviscerate. I'm not saying that it's not the King James, but I'm saying something is missing. Yeah. There is an element that is missing. And I think you're exactly right. It's an, and, and it is, I, you know, I think that, and, and I see that, man, you know, when we talked, it's so interesting. When we talked, we went out of our way. When we talked with your last interview, we went out of our way to go, we're going to discuss a theory, for lack of a better word. It does nothing to the body of Christ. It does nothing to the tribulation, premillennial, pre-tribulation. It literally changes no profound Pauline doctrine. We just think it's a possible theory that gives us more insight into something that, let's be honest, it has room for Sure. People off the charts, crazy. People off the charts, crazy about it. You know. Oh really? And you're thinking, <laughs> and you're thinking what? What are you doing, man? What What are you doing? Or I'll get people that are, you know, I love them. I love our soul trap listeners for the most part. The majority of them are great people. Every once in a while, people are upset and they're arguing. And it's like, bro, it's ghosts, man. It's, <laughs> we're talking about, you know, whether Bigfoot exists or not. You're quoting Bible script. Is that? I yeah. think that that we have lost. I think that we have lost this positional Christianity yeah. and, and there's truth. I mean, there, you, you have to grow. There is an element of growth. Um, and, and I do believe that a Christian can do things that create an unhealthy atmosphere in their life for growth. Yeah. If, if it wasn't there, we wouldn't be warned. There wouldn't be chastening. But I, I think that it is. And it's so profound. And, and I'll tell you something I've been thinking about too. I think I'm going to preach on this subject, the most forgotten verse in Bible prophecy. I was thinking about this the other day. We quote ad nauseum, ad nauseum, we quote Revelation 3. Behold, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou art uh, increased with good. Uh, I'm not quoting it right. You know, I know it's not that thou art poor, wretched, miserable, blind, period. But the very next verse of the Laodiceans, he said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold and white raiment and I salve. And then he says, whom I love, I chasten and mm-hmm. says, repent. He, he loved the Laodicean church. Yes. And he gave them the opportunity to buy the gold that they needed, wear the clothing that they needed. And, and those verses are forgotten. Yeah. And, and it's almost like, it's like, man, who can race to the most negative of how bad things are. And I get it. Things are bad. Believe me, we're doing a show called the soul trap. I get it. We're in that. Right. 
But I think <laughs> that there's still room to grow in the Lord as a Christian and to see unbelievable miracles in your life. Yes. I don't think miracle is a Pentecostal word. I, I think that there's still works to be done for the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think that's a bad thing to build a great work for the Lord. I don't think that makes you Jack Hiles. No. And I think that identifying in Christ, listen, if a Christian gets out, we are to reprove, rebuke, exhort. That if you know, Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 5, there are certain lines that God gives us. Hey, yes. you, you, you're going out of the boundaries here. But within yep. that, I think you preach and and we need to focus in on you're you're not the lowest common denominator you you are a new creature destined yeah. to be a ruler and reigner with Christ how much love has he bestowed upon us to be called the sons of god you know walk worthy of the vocation paul said wherewith you are called this is a big deal you're a big deal you matter yes you, you absolutely value. you matter yes let's grow over time god has a whole lifetime for you to grow Let's see who we are in Christ. And I just, I know that's going to get me a lot of emails, but I think that's an element that's missing, especially in our movement or our crowd. 100%. And I'm doing my best to get away from that. When, when a person goes around saying, well, I'm just a no good, worthless, wretched piece of junk, you know, well, number one, that's not what the Bible paints a picture of you as. And number two, when you say that, you are identifying with your old nature. Your old nature right. is worthless. Your old nature is, you know, all these things, the flesh, sin in the flesh. And is not, why would I want to identify with my old nature? Mm -hmm. Why would I want to go around thinking those thoughts when that, like you said, God loves me. There's nothing that can separate me from the love of Christ. Like Jesus said that the love that is in me may be in them. So the father loves me with the same love that he had for Jesus. What am I, Jesus wasn't going around saying he was worth it, you know, and all this stuff. So why should I? I have a choice to identify with the old man or the new man. That's my choice. And yeah. it's not, but it's been perceived as this pseudo humility. If I make myself as low as possible and beat myself into this spirit, this asceticism where I just whip myself metaphorically, that will make me spiritual. Again, what do you have? That's a works based system, no different from some Filipino climbing up the stairs on his hands and knees to the top of the tower in order to be, you know, show God his devotion. It's yeah. a pseudo humility talking about how garbage I am. That's not even mm -hmm. true. Jesus doesn't even look at me that way. I identify with my new nature, reckon that he loves me, I'm a child of God, I'm one with Christ, and I just try to stay in that mindset, and then yeah. the Holy Spirit can work through me. And, and also there's that identity, or I mean there's the uh, unity and this understanding if I'm that way, if that's true of me, then that's true of you. And it doesn't matter what Bible you use, it doesn't matter what denomination you're a part of, it doesn't matter what kind of worship music you sing, we're both one in Christ, and God mm -hmm. sees you the same way he sees me. And we and right. my responsibility to you is not to tear you down or cut you off, but rather to edify you and try to be a blessing. You know, and we can talk right. about Bible issue. We can talk about dispensations. But if you believe it, if you don't, at the end of the day, that's between you and the Lord. I'm your brother. I'm just here to help you. Let Paul said, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Yep. You know, there's there's a difference between somebody being false and somebody being wrong. Yep. I know a lot of good brothers who are wrong. And I'll tell them that they're yep. wrong. They probably think I'm wrong. There's a difference between that and somebody who is who is false. And we're not to have sure. fellowship with false. But somebody can be wrong and see things differently. It's interesting because Miles J. Sanford said something in the Green Letters that always stuck with me. He said, you are not your sin. And yeah. when you look at what, what Ruckman talked about in the circumcision, which I think he was really on, you know, that, that concept that you you are no longer that. You, you may struggle in that area but that is not the you that's the old man yeah and well I'm, I'm such a this no you're not that's yep. your flesh that's the old man that's a habit of living but you he that is dead in christ is freed you are yep. been set free because you have been quantumly entangled with the lord jesus christ and and however you want and and the bible's so ahead of that using terms like in through by all of those prepositions are giving us a position a position in Christ. And the more we, I believe that the more that you can see that, I think the more it gives fuel for the Holy Spirit to bring that to light, not all at once. Some yeah. Christians hit it, some it develops slowly, but the more that comes to light, the more that informs how we grow out of some of those sins that we struggle with. 
and, and, and how we develop. And I just, I agree. I think the Keswick direction, again, I do think you have to be a little careful about the, the moment one time experience. Sure. I've experienced this and boom, I've arrived. Yeah. Uh, maybe that happens for some people. I don't want to say that doesn't, but I, I, I think that there are punctuated moments. I think you go, 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 go. And you're walking with the Lord. And at a time of maturity, the Lord says, okay, let's step aside. I'm going to show you something, a bang. <laughs> there is that, that, wow, I saw that never before. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's going to happen every day, but I agree with yeah. you. I think, uh, I do think that that's an issue that we have. And, and again, it comes back to, there's so much faults out there that sometimes we get sinful by fighting against sin as the old saying is. We, we lose our perspective and our perspective is not to change everybody out there. Our perspective is to walk in the spirit. Uh, and um, yeah, man, it's just fascinating. It really, really is. Uh, and, and it's hard because there's a lot of good Christians out there that don't see the way we do. And, yeah. and you got, what are you going to do? How do you address that? How do you handle that? Um, well, very fascinating. Well, we have been talking for almost 45 minutes, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's I am so sorry to take that time, take your time up like that, but it has just been a fascinating, a fascinating thing. So uh, it's very interesting to see Final Fight. Let me ask you this. Let me pivot on this for a minute. I'm sitting here in the Soul Trap studio. You're sitting there at Final Fight. We've got the entire world crumbling down around us. We believe that we are nearing the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're seeing, we can call it paranormal activity, but we're seeing demonic activity, the likes of which maybe haven't been seen since the times of Christ. Yeah. Um, we're seeing, you know, really Sodom unfold itself before our eyes. It won't be very long before they come for the children uh, endorsing. I mean, they, they already are. It's a soft rollout, but they already are you know, mutilation of children, transgenderism, all of that. I mean, we're seeing this at, at breakneck speed. And you and I are sitting here and we're talking about the deeper life. We're talking about Andrew Murray, Watchman Nee. Um, and now we've really gone and poked some people in the eye and said, just because you carry a King James Bible, <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean that you're 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 quote unquote right with God, and then you really just sold us down the river because I brought up the whole thing of dispensationalism. So let me pivot and ask you this: Why in a world where there's so much false and there's so much confusion and so much out demonism, and in a world that we we could wake up here in 2024 and see? a pre-rapture world change like we've never seen before. Why is this important for the end time Christian? Um, and I'm kind of pulling it back into this genre a little bit, but, but why, why is it important for the end time Christian to grasp what we're talking about? Um, yes, investigation into the biblical positions of UFOs. Yes, we're looking at different things. Yes, we, we want to talk about Eden. And, and biblical geography, biblical archaeology. Yes, we want to, but but why this? Why is this on your mind? Why is this on my mind? Why is this vital for the next 12 and uh, 10 months that we're going to be facing as the world takes a turn for the, uh, what I could see as being the worst with Trump, with all of this? W what's our takeaway from this? Well, I'll give you my Matt Crane theory. And it's going to be out there. But Go for it. You're in the soul trap. So out there is good. Out there That's is what good. I love about the soul trap. I can just yeah. put out my craziest ideas and it totally works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's interesting. With We've been talking about identity-based Christianity, which I believe is the foundation of almost all of Paul's epistles, if not all of them. You find it throughout the whole thing. His constant argument was against Christians falling into a Judaistic performance-based Christianity where I'm right with God now because I'm circumcised, I obey the Sabbath, and I obey the ordinances of the law. And Paul continually is fighting against Christians and Judaizers that were trying to bring that in. So if you wanted to say what first century Christianity, we need to get back to first century Christianity, really that's first century Christianity. 
And it seems like, you know, during the Dark Ages and as, as the Roman Catholic Church built up and then the Protestant Reformation and you have Calvinism, for a very long time, the church, the body of Christ kind of fell away from the understanding of your identity in Christ and got into this works-based system, whether it was the Catholic Church. And, I, and again, I'm not saying that the Catholic Church is Christian or a part of the body of Christ, but a lot of Christians got swept up into this idea that, well, I have to do all these things. And then that just got worse and worse over the centuries. And then you have the Protestant Reformation, which is rejects the Catholicism, gets salvation right, but then is still very much in this works mindset. And if you don't perform the works, well, you are never truly saved to begin with and gets into this Calvinistic type mindset. Now in these, in the last, in the 1800s, 1700s, 1900s, you've mentioned Keswick and this resurgence of this understanding of who we are in Christ. And it seems like up until, you know, just the last couple hundred years, the church has really been re-grasping what Paul has been saying all along in the New Testament, just somehow we overlooked it. And like, even in my own life, I've been saved for over 25 years. I've been in five years of formal Bible school, and I'm just now in the last couple of years really getting a hold of this. And a number of other uh, preacher friends of mine are kind of in the same vein where they're understanding this. So how does this relate to the end times? Well, you mentioned Revelation chapter 3 and the church being rich and increased with goods and having need of nothing. And usually we perceive that, we preach that as, you know, well, in 18, uh, we, we, we relate it to the New Bible versions. 1881, the RSV came out. 1901, the ASV came out. And since then, the church has become Laodicean because they're correcting the word of God and they're going downhill. And we are in kind of the bottom of that decline. I'm not so sure that's the case. When you look at the church over the course of 2000 years, the church let has me been just pause. Great. Let me just pause you. Let me pause you. Now we're getting into some soul traps. <laughs> <laughs> now oh, you're yeah. taking us down the rabbit hole because you just absolutely blew the mind of, of many a YouTube scholar. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, well, hey, not so check, that's the key. <laughs> check this out. Check this okay. out. So, the church has been faithful to the Lord and Jesus loves his bride. Jesus loves his church. It's not like the end of it, he's just going to backhand her with. You know, you, you idiot, you know, let's get raptured and go to heaven. I think that the church has endured as a whole, as a body, has endured persecution, death, imprisonment, all kinds of deprivations for thousands, hundreds of years, thousands of years. In the end, the reason why the church is rich and increased with goods is because God has rewarded the end time church with prosperity. And... I have mentioned this before, and I think on this, the last time I was on Soul Trap, I mentioned this on Final Fight. I really think the last days of the church age is going to be a almost a counterfeit millennium, a, a time of great, great prosperity. And I, per, I, my theory is that Trump is going, is going to get back in the White House, and God is going to use Trump not to just make America great again, but to make the world great again. I just heard the other day that this president of Argentina has just... Uh, balance the Argentine budget in less than a month. And it doesn't take uh -huh. uh, rocket scientists to get these things in order. Trump tried to do as much as he could in his first four years, but the reason why he didn't get farther than he did was because he was constantly thwarted and stopped from doing what he wanted to. If he can okay. get in as a businessman, I think he can fix the economy. He can fix all kinds of things. He already made huge leaps and strides with the nations. If he was able to you know, have a relationship with Putin and not be stopped by the deep state, there could theoretically be a condition of world peace. And when the Bible says the church is rich and increased with goods, I don't see how that can just be the American Western church. The church is global. So if the church global, Revelation chapter three, is rich and increased with goods, something would have to change in our in the in the world history for all of Christianity to become prosperous, even the Christians in China, even the Christians in Iran, even the, you know, for the most part, globally, the body of Christ becomes rich and increased with goods and has need of nothing, not just Americans. The reason why I think this is a blessing of God is because, you know, people can say, well, why would God bless with riches if it's going to cause their downfall? That's, the downfall is not God's fault. God wants to bless and adorn his bride, just like he did in did in the book of uh, Ezekiel, chapter 16, he's talking to Jerusalem, the bride of God, if you will. And he says, I've decked you out with gold and pearls. Why? Because he loves her. 
he she is his crown jewel and, and he has just adorned Jerusalem with everything you could imagine under the reign of Solomon. But what happened? Jerusalem got focused on their riches and off from the Lord, just like many of the kings of Israel. And in one of them, I think it's Hezekiah, it says he was marvelously helped until he was strong. And it's uh-huh. it's like, well, then why why did God bless him with strength if that was going to be the the result? Like the Garden of Eden, God offers always offers a choice. And God doesn't want, it's not predestined that a person gets rich and then falls. It's just that tends to be a pattern. But that doesn't mean that God is at fault. You think of Lucifer. When God created, when Jesus created Lucifer, he was the Uh anointed cherub. He was decked with all this gold and all this stuff. And what happened? The Bible says in Ezekiel 28, Lucifer got looking at all that gold and, and stuff and became lifted up in pride because of his own beauty. And that caused his fall. And so what happens? We have Satan falling because of his riches, essentially. Jerusalem falling because of their riches. The church, and what happens? She becomes rich because of the blessing of God. And she ends up getting focused on herself. The perfect picture is Xerxes and uh, Vashti. I've always wondered about that passage, you know, is she coming out with the crown royal? What does that mean that she was coming to kind of come out naked and only wearing the crown? Or what's that talking about? I've heard all these theories. But I think, like, why were the people so upset about what Vashti did? Was she just a total jerk or witch or what was her what was her deal? Uh-huh. Um, I think Xerxes, being a type of the Lord, uh, wanted to put on her head the crown royal and she was going to be just decked out. And basically he wanted to bring her out and show just how much wealth he has lavished on her and by seeing her bazillion dollar dress and million dollar crown, it would Uh reflect back to the glory of Xerxes. Like, look how great of a king I am. This is what I do for my wife. But what happened? She wouldn't even come when he wanted her to come out. And what was the problem? Uh, Basically, I can't help but wonder if she got so uh, lifted up in her own wealth. I mean, she might've been just a poor pauper girl of no nobility when she got married. I don't know, but she got so fixated on her position and and my wealth. And I am the queen. Who are you to tell me? I don't need to listen to you. It's -hmm. almost like she became so wealthy. She ceased to listen to the king. And I kind of wonder if that's the picture of the church in the last days. God blesses the church with great abundance and prosperity and world peace. And the world benefits from that. The unsaved world is going to benefit also financially from that from God's blessing on the church, but that church gets their mind and focus on those riches and it goes back to the performance where it's, ah, the reason why I'm so rich and increased with goods and flourishing is because I have, my performance has done this. So let me ask you, all right, so let me push back on this and ask you. So first of all, I've got three questions then. A, couldn't you say that that's happening already, relatively speaking? Spirit, in other words, couldn't you already say we have been blessed in Western Christianity beyond anything the world, and like a tide bringing up all the others, it mm-hmm. might not be exactly the same prosperity globally, but globally there there has been a a prosperity the likes of which especially in western christianity yeah and so we have already experienced that so we we are experiencing that now and then i guess the b part of that question would be um where does second timothy three fit in the perilous times Mm -hmm. where does that fit into this particular scope that we're talking about and really tied in with that as well would be the question of Ephesians 3, you know, Acts 15, where we're, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. In other words, the church's prosperity is not fundamentally an earthly prosperity as Israel, per se, but a spiritual one, so that our treasures are, are, are in heaven. So mm-hmm. how would you align some of those things in what we're talking about? Yeah, sure. So the first one, has it already happened? That's, that's a good question. And so the, 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 mind, the idea is, well, if the prosperity is over, then really until the rapture, things are just going to get worse and worse and worse, and the world is going to be in a state of disarray, potentially. And then the rapture will happen, then the tribulation. 
Um, and I think we've talked about this before on a different episode, but it looks to me by all indications that the, the beginning of the beginning of sorrows is a time of safety and a time of wealth and prosperity for Israel of all places, you know, this uh-huh. crucible of warfare, they're so prosperous that they're not even listening to the preaching of the 144,000. There's no indication of, uh, fear or incoming disaster. Um, They're, they've got their farms, they've got their merchandise, they're marrying, they're giving in marriage. Hey, everything's great. Um, At the end of the church. I'm going to jump in there. That's an interesting point to your case because you could not say that of Israel in the last 2000 years. You couldn't say that for Israel in the last 2,500 years, 2,600 Mm -hmm. years. They have been under constant threat just for our dispensation since since Christ, since yeah. Rome. So, yeah, so to can. be free from threat to the point where, hey, we're buying, we're selling, we're giving, we're, we're good. You'd be hard pressed to, to point to any point in history where that has been the case. Yeah. And even in the last three years, Israel can't even say that. I mean, they're they're prosperous financially, but uh I mean, the Hamas attacks and the Gaza attacks and this looming war with Iran, um, they're, they're not living in peace right now. And either that is going to get worse and worse or something is going to happen to turn the tide. And these this there's going to be a relative time of peace in Israel. Okay. Um, the end of the church age seems to be a time of prosperity, as, a, as it's mentioned there in Revelation 3. Um, doesn't seem to be a time of persecution and suffering. Uh, you have the Queen of Sheba meeting Solomon type of uh, the church and, and the Antichrist. You know, the very next verse is 666 on his gold throne. And it says that uh, the Queen of Sheba basically got everything she wanted. He gave her all her heart's desire, everything she asked. And it says she turned and went to her own land. What caused her? It's almost like this weird Holy Spirit uh, is given a little clue here and there with the verbiage that he uses. The church is going to turn at the very end, there's going to be a falling away. There's going to be a, a turning in the church's heart away from the Lord. And then mm. she's going to go back to her own land. What's that? Heaven, the rapture. So you can make a loose argument there that maybe there's a type there. As far as 2 Timothy chapter 3, the perilous times, everything described in that chapter is not physical. Th- this is how I would explain it. Um, it's not a physical peril like wars, rumors of wars, all that stuff. But rather, it's a spiritual peril. The, the, the Holy Spirit in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 talks about in the latter days, they're going to be departing from the faith. And the problem is lies, doctrines of devils, and uh, this forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meat. So again, this performance, in order to be right with God, you, have, you can't do this and you have to do that. Um, Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. What's the power of the Christian? It's my identity in Christ. I can have a form of godliness because, well, I go to church five times a week. I tithe 10% of my net. I forget which one you're supposed to do. And uh, <laughs> I pass out tra- three tracks a day, you know, and I street preach and I have a King James Bible and blah, 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 blah. That's not the power of the Christian life. That's uh, my flesh. I can train my flesh to do all kinds of things. Mormons ride their bicycles and go on missions for four years. So what? That's I'm not just sitting here. I, I think it's great. I'm just sitting here watching the whole production staff on the back side over here going, oh, we're going to get <laughs> <laughs> yeah. emails are rolling in. We're not even live and the emails are rolling in. <laughs> well, I can, I can say this because I've lived this my whole life. I was under yeah. the impression I was trying to climb that ladder and I got to uh, what many would say is the pinnacle and found the whole, I don't, I'm not finding the Holy spirit here. There's something that's not right here. Yeah. There's a, there's a division and a hatred in the, in among Bible believing Christians where they'll cut you off just because you don't, because you question something or you don't align or you don't associate with this particular so-and-so. So therefore we're going to cut you off and have no fellowship with you. I began to understand, you know what, there's, there's a deep rooted problem here. Um, and I need, and I don't know what it is at the time, but I began to find out, you know what? It's not about what you do and what you don't do. It's not about your performance as a Christian. It's yeah. about who I am in Christ. I'm accepted so in the beloved. I'm accepted in Christ. So why would the brother not accept me? 
because yeah, I questioned the password somewhere. It's interesting you say that because I was just sitting there. I, I'm just, I've, it's been on my mind so very much. I, in the book that we wrote, The Little Big Church, I think I use that, Kevin. I can't remember, but uh, the term hyper remnant, this hyper remnant mentality yeah. to where it's, it's, there's, there's no more churches to be built. There's no more works to be done. What we're going to do is we're going to nitpick every last little thing. And, and I, I can imagine if I were a teenager sitting in church, they'd be like, what's, what's the point? Why do I, why should I do anything? Jesus is probably coming and anything that's bigger than 50 people is apostate anyway. And, and I know I'm being a little bit right, but, but yeah. and, and, and it's like, why? We, and it's like, wait a second. You know, I was just reading this morning in Haggai where God said, I understand that the temple isn't the same one as Solomon. But he said three times to Zerubbabel, Joshua, and to the people, be strong. Same phrase that he used to Joshua. Be strong, for as I coveted it with Moses, my spirit is among you. And that, she, listen, the Holy Spirit's still here. Yeah. <laughs> we are still in the church age. And then when I went over there to, to the book of Revelation, he, he doesn't say you're the Laodicean church. I'm going to spew you out. Sucks to be you, but hey, it is what it is. Yeah. He gives them an out. He says, even in the Laodicean age, I've got gold, I've got clothing, I've got vision. If you'll repent, I love you. I'm telling you this because I love you. You can still see some, some of the power of God. And so I'm sitting there going, man, maybe we're overhyped. And again, I know people are getting upset. I believe Christ is coming. I think we are living in days of tremendous apostasy. I just don't see how you can not look around and see that. But it's almost as if we've allowed that negativity to bleed over into us and make us afraid of being big, doing big, dreaming big, yeah. achieving big. And, 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 and I'll be honest with you, and I know this is going to get me in trouble, but what would be better? Would it, would it be better for the Lord to get to heaven? And this is my theoretical. And I'm, I'm asking this. I'm asking, Kev, you're here. I mean, you, what would be better? To get to heaven and for the Lord to say, listen, man, you you kind of missed your kazip, okay? I wanted all the women to wear nothing but dresses 24-7. <laughs> I made that clear in the Bible, and you missed it. However, you had a thriving, growing church in your community. Thousands of people were saved. Tens of thousands of people were reached around the world with your missions program. Christians were fed and they grew. You know, what, what would be better to miss that and, or for the Lord to go, hey, man, you were right. You got that pants issues right. And a lot of people didn't. And I'm really proud of you and all five people in your church. Yeah, now, right. I, know that I'm, I know that I just made a lot of people mad. I'm using extremes. Sure. But I'm, I'm asking are we missing it here? Is there a, is there a, between those two extremes? Can we navigate a part that says, Hey, I might miss it here. Maybe this is, but we're shooting for something really big. It is the end times, but where did same thing Paul said, Paul said to Timothy in second four in, in second Timothy four. And I did this this morning for the Matt this morning. I took my Bible and I drew on one side is Matthew four. I'm sorry. Second uh, Timothy four. And I drew a, a parenthesis. All that passage of chapter 3 is the context of where f he's speaking of. He says, um, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, hold on till I get there. Yeah. He said, put it in high gear and go do something great. Make full proof of your ministry, do the work of an evangelist, endure afflictions in the context of 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I yeah. think this mentality that says, eh, you know, it's kind of bad. We're going to sit here and, and figure out what's underneath the pyramid. And we're going to, we're going to, you know, Joe Biden is this and that. I get that. We're in the soul trap. I get that. But I asked you and pivoted on this. I think people miss the soul trap. I think they miss final fight because it's not sit in a corner. It's put it in high gear because we're getting ready to inherit and rule and reign with Jesus Christ, not just earthly. I, I think it's going to be interdimensionally. I think it's yeah. beyond anything quantum. I think it's universes, world without end, the Bible says. Yeah. So why are you living like, you know, it's just barely eking out? Yeah. 
I agree 100 percent. As a matter of fact, uh, I was at church this last Sunday and the pastor was preaching on uh, Matthew 16. And, you know, thou art Peter and upon this rock, I'll build my church. And he gave a, a interpretation of it that I hadn't really heard presented before. And it got me really thinking. He was basically talking about the history, you know, and where they're at. They're at Caesarea Philippi at the base of Mount Hermon near that cave of Banias, uh, Pan, you know, the god Pan coming out of the cave, kind of like those uh, Kentucky uh, goblins in uh, Hopskinville, the yes. Hopskinville goblins coming out of the cave. I can't help but wonder if there's some truth to that thing. They just, they saw some kind of interdimensional alien creature, demon, coming out of that cave, and they've just always associated it with the gates of hell. And so yeah. there Jesus is sitting right there at the base of Mount Hermon that's understood uh, at least traditionally, to be the location where the angels came down, you know, and fell and all that stuff. With en and Enoch the, wrote about that. I believe that's written about in the book of Enoch and the 200 angels. Yeah. Uh, and whether that's true or not, the people and the cultures understood or at least thought that that was the case. They reckoned that area as being the headquarters, basically, of hell or the gates of hell, where this is the power. And I, I don't like to change the word gates of hell to power of hell, but the idea is this is the capital. This is Mount Mordor right here, you know, and yeah. where Sauron lives. And Jesus is there. And, and, and again, I can't take credit for all these thoughts because this is what the pastor was pointing out. But I thought it was really good. Jesus tells Peter, you guys, you know, uh, like it's almost like when they got there, like, Jesus, do you know where we are? Do you know where we are? And Jesus changes the subject to, to do you know who I am? <laughs> uh -huh. And he says, I'm going to build my church right here. Like he might have been pointing to this rock. We always have all these interpretations. Obviously, Peter's not the rock that the Catholic Church is built on. Maybe Jesus was saying, "Upon this rock, I'll build my church." That's a, that's a true application. He's the rock. But also, he could have been saying, "You know what? This Mount Hermon that you see right here, this, this rock right here, the the gates of hell. I'm going to plant my kingdom right on top of it, and Satan's not going to do anything about it." And he says, <laughs> "I'm going to give it to you." the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound and all these things. And there's an application of sin and forgiveness in Matthew 18, but this binding and loosing in Matthew 16, those are the same terms used in conjunction with exorcism. The woman that Satan hath bound Jesus loosed on this day. It's a power over the powers of darkness. And it's like Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you my disciples power over hell. You're so terrified. You're afraid of this area. The, the gates of hell, they're not going to prevail against my church. And uh, Jesus obviously was in the heart of the earth. The gates of hell literally didn't prevail because he came out of them. But in another uh, uh, more ethereal or, or metaphorical standpoint, the, the literally the powers of darkness. And again, I don't like to, the new Bible is how they change the word. But still, Jesus has given us power to tread on serpents and scorpions in the context of evil spirits there in Luke chapter 18 or Luke chapter 10. He says, I beheld Satan which falls lightning from heaven. And then he says, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Those aren't literal serpents and scorpions. Those are spiritual beings. Jesus has given us power. And what's interesting about that whole thing is that, the, is that whole passage started with a question about identity. Who do people say that I am? G Peter says, you are, that's an identity piece, the Christ. And Christ says, you know what? And you are Peter. We're talking about identities here. Mm -hmm. He says, it's almost like I am Christ and you are Peter. Recognize who you are. Not you're Peter and you're just the greatest person that's ever lived, but recognize who you are in me. I give mm -hmm. you the power to do these things. I give you these keys. I give you these uh, this uh, authority over the powers of darkness. And then he goes on even farther. He then identifies Peter with Satan <laughs> a few verses later because right. Satan didn't want to obey the will of God. The will of God is whatever the will of God is, when you yield to the will of God, that's what you're supposed to do. And then he says, deny yourself, come after me, take up your cross. What is that? In the New Testament context, as a Christian, that's identifying with your death, burial, and resurrection in Christ. How do you get victory over the powers of darkness? Is it by obeying your will? No. It's by obeying the Father's will, yielding to the mm -hmm. Father's will, whatever that may be, taking up my cross, whatever that cross may be at any given time in my life. I yield to the Father's will. I have the power of Jesus because of who I am in Christ. And yes. Satan can't do anything about it. And it's not a thing where, oh, this, the, the powers of darkness are getting so big. UFOs are appearing and we're all 
we, we can't beat this. This is too much for us. I think it's all really fascinating and interesting. And these alien abduction stories, I think there's a thing for the whole uh, hybrid program. But it, but uh, the, the, the bottom line is we still have power over Satan and, and his kingdom of darkness. These alien stories of abductions, Christians trying to be abducted, they always claim the name of Jesus and the thing stops. Yes. So I, I, was, I don't want to call him out by name, but I was talking with a, a friend, a person you probably know, a friend of mine, and I, I, I would not call his name out, but Randy Keener and I were talking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, and again, I think in rightly dividing, we have to be wise, but I think we have so rightly divided the words of Christ out that almost the gospels in a lot of, in a lot of believers' lives in our genre uh, it's almost like Jesus, that we don't take anything that he says. Everything that he says that's power related, that doesn't belong to us. That's either for the apostles or in the tribulation. Now, when you, what we've done is I think we've let the charismatics move us off of a biblical position. Yeah. When you look at what he starts talking about in Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, in John, when you start reading John 13 through 17, that's identity. That's identity. I mean, that, that's profound. And I'm wondering, now I'm not saying that it means that we don't suffer. Sometimes the power of God is best shown through suffering. For instance, yeah. they said to Jesus, if you're the son of God, prove it and come down. Well, the great power of God was actually expressed through him remaining on the cross. Yeah. Sometimes the great power of God is shown in our, in, in our burning at the stake, our great suffering. But I also think that there is this mentality that if it's big, it's bad. If it's successful, it's compromised. Um, if it, if it, you know, we're we're just barely hanging on, barely eking out, and and we're trying to to get it rightly divided, right down to what particular letter, at what letter in the Book of Acts did it transfer over from to to, to the church? You know, those kind of things <laughs> like that. We're nitpicking here and there, and and the truth of the matter is. We have, I think, a lot more power than we realize yeah. when it comes to the Lord Jesus. I'm just wondering if we don't, we have not tapped into that. And that's what the Keswick writers talked about. Andrew Murray talked about that. I started reading, rereading E.M. Bounds book on prayer, mm -hmm. a, a, comp, a, a compendium book, a, 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 had a lot, of, a lot of his writings in there. And I'm like, man, is this guy just, is, is he blowing smoke? Or is, is this real? I mean, when you start reading what Jesus said, if you even being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more? Well, when you, when you look at that, Paul said, unto him that is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Paul said in, in Colossians that, that Christ works in me mightily. He was aware of this great power that he had in Christ, in the authority of Christ to further the gospel in the kingdom of God. So I think, I agree, man. I think that in an, in an attempt to be deep, we've actually gotten shallow. I think in an attempt to be profoundly deep and to be fair to our brethren, to draw lines where, where some of these lines should be drawn, we've actually drawn ourselves into a box. To where yeah. we're just running around in the same box. I just got a text uh, from, <laughs> from one of the guys on the team here on the other side of the TV. Are you okay with us releasing this? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I didn't know this was actually going to be recorded. But hey, that's okay. Um, I don't. I I haven't said anything that I haven't really said on. FFBR live yeah. anyway. So. <laughs> this, 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 this scrambling around going, I think it's great. I think it's good. Here's the thing that I love about this is this yeah. is what the full trap is about because it, it, we wanted to push the envelope of, of what we were seeing in the Bible. But it has almost become, to us, it's almost in some ways it's become like, I don't know, it, if you believe, we've always said it, if you believe in the spirit world, if you believe in what Paul is saying, why are we playing around with little things? Why are mm -hmm. we getting called up with all this stuff? If, if this is such a huge, big, universal thing that we're involved in, why are we nitpicking over this and that and that and this? And, and, and I agree. I, I know that for some people, I don't think there's anything that's been said by you or me that is in the, in the spirit of we're better than somebody else or these people are bad or this or that. 
I just think it's time for us as Bible believers, if we're going to be if we're going to be Bible believers in interpreting your know, dispensations, we have to be Bible believers all the way through, and 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 we have to see ourselves as the way that Christ is defining us, and Paul is defining us, and the Bible is defining us. We're not pieces of human garbage that get saved and dragged into heaven, kicking and screaming. We we are new creatures. We we are joint heirs with Christ under an involved world where there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And and it's an amazing thing. And I just think a lot of Christians don't live up to what they could. A lot of it is because as soon as they fail, their day-to-day life is based upon a performance. I was really good today. I blew it yesterday. I'm better today. Instead of, hey, I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me. I love you as my father, but we're in this process together. And we're working on it together. And the Lord is well, chasing me if I get out of line. But, but his desire, even in chastening, is to bring out the precious fruit of, of, of holiness, not condemnation. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know if, uh, if I, I'll, I'll throw one more thing in there. I don't want to take too much time. I know we've been no, going. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah, exactly. You're talking about you know, boxing ourselves in the church, this, the condition that it's right. It is right now. And how we don't seem there's the power is relegated to the apostles. And it's like, no, we, like I said, we're, we're glorified with them. We have power and uh, maybe not power to heal necessarily, you know, and all those apostolic signs and wonders that were predominantly for Israel. But as far as the spiritual realm, there's absolutely power. There's power over sin. There's power over demons. Um, I, Anyway, I'll moving on. There is power. And I, I know that on a personal basis. But um, Paul said to the Galatians, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are bapt or, or whosoever you are justified by Baptist traditions, you're fallen from grace. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, basically that's essentially what the law is. There's a new uh, Christian conservative fundamentalist law, this legalism that you have to achieve. He says, whosoever you are justified by that. Obviously, these were saved Christians. They weren't truly justified by that. They were justified by the blood of Christ. But in their minds, they had gotten on, onto this thing where they were entangled again in the yoke of bondage. And he says, if you're justified, if you in your heart think you're justified by that, you haven't lost your salvation. You've just fallen away from the grace of Christ. You are fallen. And so I wonder if that falling away in the in the last days of the church that we know is prophesied is not a fall of the church into debauchery and all this uh, sinful wickedness and people are just getting tattoos and doing drugs or something like that. <laughs> and again, I'm, I'm exaggerating there. It's right. No, I understand what you're saying. Out of tattoo. But anyway, so the concept is um, what if the falling away is not what we think it is? What if the falling away is not new Bible versions and false doctrine as much as it is the church in the last days is flourishing and doing so great. And there's a revival of hyper conservative, hyper hyper conservatism, hyper conservative Christianity, where once again, the whole entire body of Christ is under this impression of if I have the right Bible, if I have the right name on my church, if I'm doing this and doing that, that makes me justified. That makes me right. with God. Okay, I think you can say that, but I think you would have to make it a two way street. Because I don't think it would just be a hyper conservatism that says uh, a hyper strictness. I think I would agree with that. But I think that the reverse side would be the other side of our Christian brethren would say, because I am so accepting, because I am so loving, because I am so tolerant, because I am so this, I am acting like Jesus and more than Brother Matt. I'm even more tolerant of the LGBT. I'm even more tolerant of this. I am more like Jesus than even he is. Whether it's a conservative or a liberal, the root is still me. Yes, yeah, thank you for making that balance. Yeah, that is a really great thing, yeah. I'm really glad you made that point because like the uh, commercials during the Super Bowl, one of the Jesus commercials, you know, some of those were kind of ridiculous, but I, that that was, that out, and I do agree with that. Yeah, what that commercial was saying, in essence, was 
um, to the conservatives is that we are. I am more yeah. like Christ. But right. it, it was still what they were doing. That did not really point people to Jesus. That yeah. did not root them in a regenerative identification with Christ yes. away from self. And I think self-righteousness can look in two ways. Self-righteousness yeah. can look like condemnation. Self-righteousness can also look like compassion. Yes. I, I, it. Yeah, I am this. When ultimately it, the, the true position is it's not me con condemning or compassionate. I, Paul said, I am what I am in Christ. It is yes. in Christ's sufficiency alone. Okay. Well, yeah. here's what we're going to do. We, if you are watching, <laughs> you need to go and you need to get this book. You need to get Eden's Fate. Because in the near future, we are going to interview <laughs> Matt Payne again <laughs> about what I think is a fascinating, fascinating <laughs> study. Where is the Garden of Eden? Now, this is probably, I love the doctrinal on the end times, and I love the book on the doors. I thought that was great. This one right here, to me, was the best of both worlds. Doctrinal, insightful, speculative. I think there's some things we want to jump in here about. I want to even get into Adam and Eve and maybe children prior to Cain and Abel. Some, some other authors have written about that, those kind of things. You need to get this book, but if you're watching this and you have been watching it, you have entered into the soul trap. There is no boundary at the soul trap. We go where the truth takes us and we connect dots. You need to make sure to check out Final Fight Bible Radio. If you're a Christian, young Christian, old Christian, if you're a Bible-believing King James biscuit-eating Baptist, or if you are a tattoo wear, uh, tattooed earring-wearing Christian, uh, we might make us a little nauseated, but still, we love you. <laughs> Wherever you are, check out Final Fight Bible Radio. And I hope that you have enjoyed this conversation. It's been an organic one. It's been a raw one. But it has been a conversation between two Christians that are radically, fanatically in pursuit of the truth. And the truth is not a person, a group, a thing. The truth is Jesus Christ. Christ. And so we hope that you've enjoyed this conversation. Reach out to us. Make sure to check out The Soul Trap. Like and share. Check out Final Fight Bible Radio. And Matt, next time we will come and we will stay on task and we will get to your book. And uh, we appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Thank you so very much. Thank you. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heavy, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. But in the last days, perilous times shall come.